On the west coast of Antarctica lies a small body of ice, the Thwaites Glacier, that may be tied more directly to the future of Earth as we know it than any other geographical feature on this planet. It represents the perfect storm of location, vulnerability, and chain reaction potential that has earned it the nickname the Doomsday Glacier. Its loss could raise sea level by more than 3 meters and plunge cities from New York to Miami to London below the waterline. But a new series of studies associated with the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, or ITGC, just released findings that have rewritten what we thought we knew and understood about this unfolding crisis. And they've given us a deeper insight into what is actually causing this glacier to disintegrate before our very eyes. It also casts light on how little we truly understand and how complicated this system really is. Let's start with what we thought we knew. In 1945, above the Antarctic Ocean, the US Navy performed an airborne photographic survey as part of Operation High Jump, becoming the first to capture and identify the Thwaites Glacier, blissfully unaware of the threat that lurked below. Standing at one kilometre tall, the glacier would tower over the Burj Khalifa by 172 metres, or half the Eiffel Tower, my favourite unit of measure. It is also the widest glacier on the planet, at 120 kilometres wide, giving this behemoth a staggering air area of 192,000 square kilometers. It is part of a massive bowl of ice, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, nearly three times the size of Texas. And we've detected for a while now that ice around Antarctica is retreating as ocean temperatures begin to warm, but Thwaites in particular seems to be retreating rapidly and already accounts for 4% of sea level rises on Earth, losing about 50 billion tons of ice each year. While kind of terrifying, this amount isn't doomsday level threat just yet, like the headlines sometimes suggest. So how can we get this glacier to go from catastrophic to total annihilation? It all comes down to geography. The distribution of ice across Antarctica largely sits atop a landmass, topped up by snow that pushes ice towards the coasts, extending it into the ocean to produce what's called an ice shelf, a floating body of ice. On the eastern coast, when the ice shelf recedes, it exposes ice perched atop a landmass, which slopes gently upward, making it increasingly difficult for warm ocean currents to continue contacting and melting further ice mass. However, on the west coast, as the ice shelf melts, warm waters encounter a slowly downward sloping terrain, so that much of the West Antarctic ice sheet actually sits below sea level. As the ice melts, ocean waters rush in under the glacier, undermining it and potentially causing a rapid runaway process. From this map, we can see that the Thwaites Glacier looks almost like a plug in the West Antarctic ice wall. If at any point it does fail, it would allow the ocean access deep into the inner Antarctic ice mass. Due to the catastrophic sea level rise that would occur if this happened, the breaching of the Thwaites Glacier and subsequent disgorgement of the West Antarctic ice sheet are what is known as a tipping point in climate science. Over a 25-year period of study, Antarctic ice sheets, including Thwaites, have collectively lost about 8 trillion tons of ice, averaging about 330 billion tons annually. The Thwaites glacier alone has lost about 1 trillion of this 8 trillion tons during this period, and it is estimated that if it does melt completely, it could raise sea levels just by itself by about 65 centimetres. And if this then triggers the collapse of the wider West Antarctic ice shelf, sea levels could rise by up to 3 metres. That's a problem because humans have this tendency to build cities near water. About 10% of the planet lives less than 10 metres above sea level. If sea level rises, that potentially erases large parts of cities like New York, the White House becomes beachfront property, and Florida man's natural habitat is significantly reduced, though this may just prompt his next step of evolution. The global consequences of these sea level rises could be dramatic, but what evidence do we actually have that these glaciers are in fact melting so fast? I want to cover that, but first I have to thank today's sponsor, Delete Me, who much like Thwaites is deleting cities off the map, Delete Me has been helping me delete my personal information off the internet. 
I run a venture capital fund and I'm a YouTuber. My personal data is scattered across hundreds of data broker sites across the internet, making me a prime target of cold emails, robocalls, spam, and some kind of weird messages. Delete Me has genuinely been an absolute game changer. It takes about two minutes to complete the sign up process and Delete Me's privacy experts will then track down where your info is being sold online by data brokers, remove it, and then keep monitoring these sites to make sure that it stays gone. It is genuinely really satisfying to see your digital footprint of personal information information disappear before your very eyes. Since using Delete Me, I've seen a huge drop off in the number of unwanted outreaches, and it's given me time back to focus on what matters, like figuring out how we're going to deal with massive glaciers trying to rearrange our coastlines. If you want to take control of your privacy, head to deleteme.com forward slash Dr. Ben and use code Dr. Ben for a 20% discount. Thank you Delete Me for supporting the channel. Now back to the video. We know that this rapid melting is happening from a whole host of different experiments, from drilling to sonar to even satellite images. But one approach I thought was particularly interesting was looking at these small mounds of ice that seem to stay fixed in their locations even as the ice flows around them. As glaciers typically flow outward from the central thickest part of the ice towards the edges due to the gravitational pressure much like water flows from high to low ground, when an ice sheet encounters a high point on the seabed, it is pushed up and rises, producing a bump on the ice's surface called a pinning point. These points both slow a glacier's flow out into the sea, but also tell us from the height of the bump a measure of the thickness of the ice sheet below. Then by monitoring these ice bumps over time, you can see if an ice sheet is increasing or decreasing in thickness. If we look at these images taken of the same area between 1972 and 2022, we see an overwhelming proportion of these pinning points reducing in size. This trend also holds true when we survey all of West Antarctica. The red circles here are pinning points that are decreasing in size, the blue ones are increasing. We find that the ice sheet is thinning by on average about 4 meters per year, which given the surface area of these ice bodies becomes a significant volume of missing ice. And that ice lost from these shelves is worrying, but of a greater concern is what is happening below. This point is where the ice touches the seabed, and is called a grounding line, which due to the slope of the sea floor under Thwaites, as it falls back it allows warm ocean water to flood in, destabilizing the ice above. Since 1992, this grounding line has retreated by 14 kilometers, nearly 9 miles, and we can actually see the evidence left by this process in action. As part of the Thwaites Offshore Research, or THOR project, one of the most aptly named studies out there, researchers found trails left by these grounding line movements. These ribs, as they're called, show the contact point of Thwaites when it was resting on the sea floor, leaving impressions as it moved up and down with the tides. Here researchers found that it was receding at points at a rate of 2 kilometers per year. This is faster than we have ever seen this sort of glacier ice retreat. Last month though, published in the Journal of nature, a deeper exploration of the landscape below Thwaites revealed a confusing set of results. The pace of melting under much of the ice shelf was actually much slower than previously estimated, but the glacial breakup was much faster. How is that possible? <laughs> As part of the Melting at Thwaites Grounding Zone study, apparently the marketing team was off that day, the research team used a hot water drill to bore a hole nearly 600 meters deep through the ice into the water space between the seabed and the bottom of the ice sheet. Over several days, the team sent down a torpedo-like robot called Icefin, the Swiss Army knife of glacial study, allowing the team to measure ocean temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, all while capturing high-resolution imagery and mapping the sea floor and ice space in 3D. What they found was totally unexpected. Counter to all of our current models, the bottom of the ice sheet simply hadn't melted at all, or at least was melting significantly slower than we expected. The speed of this melting is called the basal melt rate, and fortunately for us, Icefin was able to collect data that has helped us understand why it may be melting so slowly. This graph here shows conservative temperature, that's not a political statement, it's a measure of true heat content of water, which is a mixture of temperature, salinity and several other factors, and it maps that heat content as a function of depth. Now it takes a second to notice it, but have you seen something strange about this graph? Here we see cold water is at the top of the water column, and hot water 
is at the bottom. Now my working understanding of the universe was that hot things rise and cold things sink. That is both true for air and why hot air balloons work, as well as in water, and why throughout the world's oceans, cold water currents snake across the bottom of the seabed and warm waters circulate higher up. So why under Thwaites do we get such a strange behavior of water temperature? What we haven't considered here is density. As the ice melts, it releases cold, fresh water less dense than the salt-containing water below, even though that salt-containing water is much warmer. The term for this is density stratification, but the fact that this gradient preserves all the way down to the ocean floor where the hottest water is located is just really weird. Usually, tidal turbulence disrupts the cold fresh water and causes it to mix with salt water. Under Thwaites, though, the currents are unexpectedly slow for a reason that we still don't fully understand. But as a consequence, this setup forms a stable boundary layer, and as a result, a temperature gradient that resembles something much more similar to a cold solid next to a hot solid than what we would usually see in a liquid or ocean-like scenario. However, the negative consequence of this insulating barrier, though, is that it doesn't extend to the grounding line. The grounding line, as a result, is melted away with the hottest water available. Because all trends refuse to be self-consistent, IceFin and other research teams did ultimately find locations where this pattern didn't hold completely true. Colossal cathedral-like cavities were found under the ice sheet, some of them 10 kilometers or 6 miles long, and nearly as tall as the Empire State Building. These were potentially caused when warm water mixing had occurred under the glacier, maybe over particular seabed features or bumps in the landscape, or changing currents or tides that would bring warmer water in contact with the ice and result in rapid, localized basal melting. Even stranger, when measuring the flow direction, IceFin found that cold water seemed to, on average, be moving east, with warmer, deeper waters moving west out to sea. Researchers are slightly stumped as to why this is, but believe it may be a combination of glacial melts from the grounding zone, subglacial lakes that periodically fill and drain, and the variation in other meltwater production processes. And now all of this is interesting because it tells researchers something new. Turbulence and melting just behaves differently than how we thought which is important when we want to make better models to predict Thwaites' future. And although here there is a slight silver lining of slower melting rates, which sounds good, this doesn't actually give us as much hope as maybe it sounds like it should. Hot water is still being exposed to the grounding line, causing it to retreat ever more quickly. This undermines the ice pack structure as a whole, leading to the formation of large crevasse structures, staircasing their way up through the ice. Melting here is especially important in these crevasses, as water funnels through them and heat and salt can be transferred into the surrounding ice, widening the crevasses and rifts, and potentially destabilizing the glacier as a whole. But what does this all actually mean? Overall, the fate of Thwaites, which is hard to say, seems largely inevitable without very meaningful intervention. It will break up. It's just a matter of the timescales that we are now arguing about. The recent findings seem to disprove full breakdown in the next 5 to 10 years, like some previous studies claimed. Now the timescales seem more like 50 to 150 years. But here I also think it's important to stress that science is the art of finding things out, not the art of having all the answers. But over the next few years, our understanding of this process will continue to evolve in a meaningful way. The question really behind all of this is what do we actually do about it? Faced with uncertainty and the potential of rapid collapse and extreme sea level rise, when, not if, Thwaites melts, some teams around the world are turning to glacial geoengineering, using technologies to slow or stop glacial retreat. Some of the ideas for protecting the Thwaites and other marine terminating glaciers are all kind of wild. John Moore, a glaciologist and geoengineering researcher at the University of Lapland, had made headlines a couple of times, with aims of deploying a 62 mile long underwater curve to stop warm seawater from reaching the glaciers, and with a secondary benefit of if you can't see it, maybe it's not happening. They estimate, though, that it would take $50 billion for this project, and that sounds kind of like a lot, but most estimates by government bodies suggest that it will cost about $14 trillion per year by 2100 to build the coastal defenses necessary to keep cities above water. So actually stopping the water rise where it is actually melting could be the simplest solution. Other groups are suggesting deploying long underwater piping and pumping air through
through holes drilled into that pipe to create an air bubble curtain with the same effect of slowing down tidal mixing. Similar technologies are already deployed around some drilling operations to limit noise pollution into nearby reefs, so this infrastructure may actually be quicker and ultimately cheaper to deploy. But I guess I'm always interested in the answer of, well, who is actually going to get started or maybe pay for doing something about this? This is a map of the east coast of the US. If you're in Boston, New York, Washington DC, Tampa, Miami, or many other cities, these are all places that are major economic centers and are also in the firing line. This story repeats itself across all countries with coastal territories. And even if you don't live in an affected city, a fall in a global economic center attached to your country or not affects everyone. Maybe for economies that are at the top of this pack that want to stay there, there's an argument for acting sooner rather than later. I personally would much rather we were building ice curtains than rebuilding every single city 100 miles inland. There are many questions that remain about the extent of what we are witnessing, how quickly this will happen and what ultimately will be the consequences. And the honest answer is, we don't know yet. Scientific teams continue to refine their understanding of what an incredibly complicated and nuanced problem this actually is, one that we don't have anything to compare it to. And it's not just in our oceans that we are seeing these sorts of signals on the rise. I already did a video on other signs that we are entering a full-blown Ice Age termination event, which if you want to, you can check out here or down in the description below. If you think scientists are rock stars, go grab yourself a t-shirt like this one down in the link in the video description. Thank you again to Leap Me for sponsoring this video, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next week. Goodbye. I guess now's as good a time as any to tell you I'm moving. Probably should be somewhere uphill.